the church, um, I, wish, I wish everyone could go to camp and hear the preaching and hear the testimonies and experience that. I love camp. I love camp for a long time. I've been to camp when I was in high school and junior high. I went to camp and went to maybe a little different style camp and, and a lot of people there. And I love what our camp looks like and does. And I love when I hear these young people get up front on Thursday night and share from, uh, from their heart what God did. And like Pastor Ryan said, I was encouraged because um, there were many more testimonies than was represented tonight. But you heard like this particular person say, listen, I was reading in my Bible and God spoke to me this way. And I heard it at devotion times before in Tibet. I heard this truth. And that's great to hear that God is touching and God is changing and God is moving. And that is what needs to happen in all of our lives. Right, not just the teenagers and not just the juniors. I'm glad for that, thrilled for that. But I'd love for some senior saints to get fired up here on the inside. Maybe even say along the way some calloused Christians to have that, that, those layers pulled back and that crustiness pulled back. And some of you who are not as old who have grown up here remember camp. Remember some of those services. I look out here and I see some. You know, I see John and Katie. You guys went to camp, a lot of camps. Long time ago. You guys are old now. And Anthony, you were there, and many others. See there, Nikki, and goodness, good to have you back here. Well, you went to camp, and you saw that. And um, man, Craig, boy, we played paintball together a long time ago. Long time ago. Look over here, and I could go on in each section. There's people who went to camp, and um, and sometimes we forget, Christian, what it's like for God to touch us. We come to church, and we listen at the right time. We sing at the right time, and we make the right motions. But it's it's empty right here. I want to give us just one thought. It's from the message I preached Thursday night at camp. I'll preach the one on Tuesday, which is God always gets his way at another time in life here. But I want to give us just one thought tonight. I think God would have us to do that. And I'll pick up Psalm 23, Lord willing, next Sunday night, unless the Lord changes it. But the question is this, that I want you to contemplate tonight. That I want you to think about. What if God responds to you like you respond to him what if God if I can treat you spiritually like you treat him spiritually now this is not a made up hypothetical question this is not just a, a question for a sermon that we're just going to grab out of thin ear and then preach an hour and a half with some stories and make you scared we actually find it in the word of God so we got to find truth right and the Bible speaks to us about a time when I was in my devotions right before camp and praying about what God had me to bring. And the Lord brought me across a passage found in the book of Zechariah. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Zechariah chapter number 7. In my Bible, it's page 778. On my phone, it's the one that starts with Z and ends in Echariah. So however you get there, turn to Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah is a minor prophet. Just a designation that we give to him and kind of lump together some of the prophets, some of the books of the prophets toward the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah was born during the building or the rebuilding of the temple. So if you read the book of Nehemiah, you will find Zechariah's father mentioned and his name mentioned in Nehemiah. If you know about Nehemiah, then you probably know about Ezra, who was there a little bit before Nehemiah. And in fact, there's some reference to Zechariah's father in Ezra. So Ezra, Nehemiah, that's the same time that Zechariah would have been alive. If you're familiar with the Old Testament at all, you'll have known probably about the story of Daniel. And Daniel, of course, when he was young, purposed in his heart. And Daniel stood before a number of great leaders and kings and always pleased the Lord. In fact, we can find no, negative, uh, no negativity about Daniel in the Bible. Just positive and uh, character about Daniel. Zechariah would have been born maybe about 15 years or so after Daniel would have probably died. What that looks like is that 15 years ago, we, we know of people who were alive 15 years ago. We know stories of people that, who knew people that were alive 50 years ago, maybe even 75 years ago, but 15 or 20 years is not a very large amount of time. This is where Zechariah is at, and, and my point in that is this, that when Zechariah was prophesying 
when he was preaching, when he was proclaiming the word of God, there was no shortage, there was no lacking of knowledge about what God desired. All right, as you look at Ezra, as you look at Nehemiah, as you look at Daniel, and you look at Zechariah, God is very, very, very clear. They're supposed to please him. In fact, Ezra will talk about, listen, you've, you've married and you've entered in contracts and covenants with people that you should have no business being in, so stop that. And people respond to that. And Nehemiah, the challenge is to rebuild the walls and quit putting your own priorities first, but put God's house and his priorities above, above your own. No shortage of revelation from God. And I find a comparison in 2023 that there is no shortage of what God desires. We know we have access. We have the ability to search out what God wants to communicate to us. We don't have the option to pretend that we don't know what God wants. Now, at times, we may feel confused, and the will of God may be murky, but the revelation of God is everywhere. Many of you don't have just one Bible, but you have multiple Bibles. And on your phone, an iPad, on a computer. Many of you have verses up in your house, on the wall. There is no shortage of God's revelation. But what if God were to treat you spiritually like you treat him spiritually? I want to turn your attention to Zechariah chapter number 7. You must understand that when we come to the minor prophets, God is typically not happy. Categorically, as you read in the minor prophets, in Haggai, and Malachi, and Zechariah, and Zephaniah, that God is not pleased. These are not books of abundance and blessing, but decrees. All right, and God is saying, listen, turn to me, come back to me, follow me, quit rejecting me, listen to me. And that story is the same story we find in Zechariah, chapter number 7. Beginning in verse number 9, where Zechariah says, begins with this phrase, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts. Now when a prophet would say this, they were speaking as from the mouth of God himself. There was not the entire written Bible like we have it today, and so God would often reveal his revelation, his word, through the prophets. And they'd begin their, they'd begin their prophesying by saying, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord of hosts. So Zechariah is approaching this section saying, listen, this is what God is saying. This is not Zechariah's interpretation. This is not Zechariah's parable or story or illustration. This is Zechariah saying, this is what God has. He says in verse number 9, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion to every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. Look at verse number 11. But they, what are those next three words? Help me here. Read them with me. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Understand what Zechariah is saying from the mouthpiece of God. He's saying, listen, I have a plan for you. I have a will. I have a direction, a revelation for you. I want you to do a few things. I want you to, to, to please me and to, and to show compassion and mercy and to not oppress the stranger or the fatherless and the widow. And don't imagine evil in your heart against your brother. He's saying, these are some things I want. These are my words for you, my commands for you. And he says, listen, but you would not hearken. You wouldn't listen to me. You stopped your ears. And you pulled away your shoulder. And basically you said, I don't want to listen and to hearken to what you have for me. Understand when men, 
when men and women have this reaction to God, God is not pleased. And merely sitting in church, merely nodding at the right time and and getting up and getting down at the right time does not mean we're hearkening to the Word of God. Now, I think as we hearken, we will will come to church. We want to hear from God. But being in church does not make us a listener. You can be here in church every single service, and your heart can be far from God. You can hear the Word of God and not hearken to it. I think if we're honest as Christians, and if you've been a Christian for any amount of time, there have been times in our life as a Christian when unfortunately we've said no to the Lord. We've been struggling against what God wants us to do. That internal in our spirit where God says, I want you to do this, and we say no. Or in essence, we don't hearken. We stop our ears. We pull away our shoulder. The reality is, Christian, that we are deceived at times because we're deceived because we think that by merely coming to church and by merely opening the word of God that now we'll be a good Christian. And the Christian life is not a list of do's and don'ts. Show up here and open this here and close this here and close your eyes here. But the Christian life is a relationship with the Savior and with the God of the universe. It's listening to him. It's responding to him. It's loving him. But I want you to notice now what God says in verse number 13. Therefore. The word therefore tells us because, because of what has happened previously, because you would not hearken, because you stopped your ears, because you pulled away your shoulder, therefore, it has come to pass that as he cried, And they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. What if God were to respond to you spiritually like you respond to him? This is not a made-up hypothetical question. This is not even, in this particular verse, an encouraging truth, though there are some encouraging truths in this, and we'll share that in just a moment. But it is a reality. And God says, because you have rejected me, and you've rejected my words, when you cry out to me, I will not listen to you. This is a hard truth. A tough truth. In one sense, we believe that God always, always responds. That God never treats us other than his character. And that is true, but this is the character of God. The character of God is one of of intense jealousy in his holiness. The character of God is love and compassion. And this response is not a petty response. This response is not a a tit-for-tat response like it would be perhaps with another human being. You did this to me, someone do this to you. No, no, this is the sobering response from a loving yet holy God who says, listen, I have poured out my love to you. I have poured out my words to you. I have poured out my compassion and you would not listen. You would not respond You stopped your ears. You pulled away. Maybe you remember when Jesus Christ looked over Jerusalem and he said almost the same thing. Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. He said, how oft I would have gathered you. as chicks. He said, but you would not. My friends, what if God responds to you spiritually tonight like you've been responding to him? Maybe you've been in church your whole life, yet you're saying, God, I'll give you this, 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 but you can't have this. 
What if God treated you with the same lackadaisical approach that you've given to him in church tonight or this morning? Oh, you're here. You're here. But you're not here. You see, this is not about an uncaring or an unknowing God, but a God who is full of mercy and compassion and love, but a God who is a holy God, a God who is a jealous God, a God who is a deserving God. And here God says, they wouldn't listen, so I've determined not to listen as well. I wonder if this next week, God treated you just like you've treated him this past week. What if God said, like some of you have said, Lord, I'll fit you in when it works in my schedule. I won't give you that dedicated time in my relationship. I won't give you that time of prayer. I'll fit you in when I can fit you in. What if God did that same thing to us and said, well, listen, I'll fit you in when I can fit you in. I know you have a big need. I know that you're really worried about this, but I just don't have time right now for you. I've got a whole world to operate in. And I'll fit you in when I can fit you in because that's what you've done to me. What if God said, well, listen, when you're praying and you're super distracted, I'll be super distracted as I listen to you pray. Oh, you're talking to me? What? Huh? What if, instead of pleasing, like some of us do, we don't really do anything God wants us to do. We don't do anything that God really likes. We just want to be content with whatever. What if God were to say, well, fine, I will answer all your requests with nothing you will really like, and you better be happy with it. What if God were this week were to treat me and treat you spiritually like we've treated him? Now, the fact is, God is merciful. God is so much better than we are. God is gracious, full of compassion. In fact, the Bible says in Lamentations, one of my favorite portions of Scripture, this I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. The fact is, if God were to treat us every day like we treat him, we would not be around today. He's merciful, he's compassionate, he's gracious. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him. To the soul that seeketh him, it is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. But my friends, do not take for granted that God will be endless with someone. Do not take for granted that his patience will not run out. Because throughout Scripture, we see at times that happening. But we also see that when we respond to God, He responds to us. I read you a few verses. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse number 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. God says, when you search for me, I'll respond to you in that way and you will find me. My friends, no one who has come to God has ever been turned away. It is when we reject God that we'll be rejected by him. But no one, in fact, Jesus Christ said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. No one who has come to God has been turned away from God. The Bible says this, draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. My friends, perhaps today, this past week, this past month, this past year, perhaps you've treated God poorly. Perhaps you've treated him haphazardly, half-heartedly, and have not listened to him. Perhaps you've not hearkened to his instruction You've known what he's wanted in your life, but you've said not today or no way. Perhaps you've gone so far to say, God, please. My friends, I'm so thankful to know that God's compassions are new and his faithfulness is new. And he is a faithful and compassionate God. And tonight, I encourage you. 
to treat God the way he deserves to be treated. That means when he speaks, we listen. We listen. And not just listen in one ear, out the other. But listen with intention. Listen with obedience, like you heard the young people speak of tonight. Listen for direction. How about tonight we determine and we ask God that we will determine to seek his face in that real relationship, right, Ruth? To really know God. I promise you, as the Bible says, authority of the word of God, when you seek him, you will find him. And you will love what you find. Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. No one who has ever tasted of God has been disappointed. And this week, why don't you seek to surrender to God? To say, God, whatever you want, that's what I'll do. Quit resisting. Quit arguing, quit excuse making, quit fighting, quit struggling, and just follow God. So what if God were to respond to us spiritually like we respond to him? The truth is, from what I read in the Bible, he often does. And those that will seek him will find him. And those that will seek to draw near to him We'll be close to him. And you can be as close to God as you want to be. An old saint, former campers, FBC, adults, crusty Christians at times, not all of them, but crusty Christians, those are calloused. Maybe it's time we draw, draw back to God. Maybe it's time us adults set the stage for these young people, for these teenagers, so they're not the ones responding to God in spite of us, but because of us. So they're not the ones that have the tender heart and they're the only ones in the church so that the ones who have been saved for years and have seen God work time and time again and have tasted of God's goodness time and time again, how about our hearts are rekindled and our passions reignited And we again taste of God's love, his mercy. And we lead the charge. Not just the teenagers.